on this Sunday night, state of emergency in Alberta. Out of control wildfires force thousands to flee. The siren was going off, it just seemed like a war zone. What it's like on the ground during this rapidly evolving emergency. The crown and colonialism. For some people, it is a symbol of white supremacy. The unsure future for King Charles' Commonwealth countries. A new chapter in the fight for gender equity. Men read books by men, unless the woman is quite old like me. Author Margaret Atwood's attempt to shake up publishing. Saying goodbye to Gordon Lightfoot, how his hometown is honoring the icon. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to begin with the wildfire situation in Alberta, where a province-wide state of emergency is now in place. Nearly 25,000 people have been forced from their homes. Right now, 109 fires are burning across the province, and about a third of those fires are classified as out of control. Nithu Garcha is in the northern Alberta town of High Level, not far from a cluster of major fires, and she joins us now with the very latest. Nithu, it looks quite windy where you are, so what is the latest? That's right. The weather is changing a fair bit, and that's one of the biggest challenges for fire crews far. I'm standing in front of a donation center here in high level as evacuees continue to rely on firefighters who are battling those flames and contending with conditions like this, as well as on the kindness of strangers. People have been stepping up to support however they can. Meanwhile, the city of Calgary says it's working with the province to open up a reception center there tomorrow. This helicopter gets set to take off Sunday from the high-level airport. A facility that's quickly become the base for crews continuing to contend with difficult weather conditions and fire activity as they fight a cluster of out-of-control wildfires. We're fine, okay? Local officials and residents say this is unlike anything they've seen in this part of northern Alberta in over a decade. This is the first time I've ever been evacuated in 11 years. Her home community of Rainbow Lake is among the latest in a string of evacuation orders across the region. I feel as if I'm going to come back to my home. Um, I think that we made the right choice on evacuating our citizens. High level has become a haven for hundreds. Town officials making room in a curling rink beside an arena already full with evacuees from Fox Lake. The community is filling up fast. We just don't have the space with everything that's going on right now. We have been looking into building a new facility that will be able to um, host people as well as having the cots and the blankets and everything available for people would be very beneficial to our whole region. Especially with all of this unfolding during a provincial election, they hope their calls to all levels of government for help building that evacuation centre will be acted on. Alberta's state of emergency declared Saturday gives the government power to access emergency funds and mobilize more support. As evacuation orders have continued to roll in west of Edmonton this weekend, the Edmonton Expo Center has become a haven for evacuees from all over the province, including the town of Edson and other parts of Yellowhead County, Parkland County and Drayton Valley. It's amazing what they had set up on such short notice. When we got here, I was really stressed because I was really wanting to go home and I hope our house is okay. That sentiment also being felt by many in the town of Hinton, northeast of Jasper, where a box door parking lot has turned into a campground for hundreds of residents seeking refuge during this already unprecedented wildfire season. Now here in high level, they estimate some 1,000 evacuees are here from multiple communities, including Fox Lake and Rainbow Lake. And Alberta Wildfire says more than 70 wildland firefighters are here from Quebec and Ontario, and they've been deployed to the areas where they're needed most. Farah? Okay, Nithu Garcha in high level, Alberta. Thanks for your coverage, Nithu. Let's talk about what's next now, because slightly cooler temperatures and even some rain showers are providing a sliver of relief in the wildfire zone. We go now to global meteorologist Tiffany Lizay. She has a look at what's going to happen in the next few days. What will it bring, Tiffany? Well, Farah, there is some relief, but it's short-lived. So here's a look at that upper ridge of high pressure that's been sitting over Alberta throughout the work week, bringing those hot, dry conditions. That has started to break down, a low-pressure system and a front starting to push in, bringing some 
uh, much needed moisture to some fire prone areas. Now the good news with that, yes, we need the moisture. The bad news is as this omega block starts to break down, we are seeing some instability. We want the rain, we don't want those lightning strikes because areas are so tinder dry. Now we'll continue to see some scattered showers across Alberta throughout today, throughout tomorrow, and even throughout Tuesday. We'll also see this southeasterly flow pushing that smoke up into the northwest. The bad news, as the week progresses, another sprawling ridge of high pressure will start to build. And by Mother's Day, hot, dry weather returns to the province, making conditions ripe once again for wildfires across Alberta. Farah? Such a challenging situation there. Global News meteorologist Tiffany Lise, thank you for that, Tiffany. In Ukraine, the leader of Russia's Wagner mercenary group is signaling a U-turn in his decision to withdraw troops from the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut. It has been the location of some of the war's bloodiest battles for months. And the reversal comes at a time of renewed concern about the safety of Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Redmond Shannon reports. Preparations in Moscow ahead of Victory Day on Tuesday, commemorating Soviet sacrifice in the Second World War. Security is a high concern after the drone attack on the Kremlin this month. Moscow called it a Ukrainian attempt to assassinate Vladimir Putin. Kyiv denies any involvement. The important holiday was likely leverage for Wagner Group boss Yevgeny Prigozhin. On Friday, he posted a gruesome video of the bodies of his mercenaries, threatening to withdraw Wagner from the contested Ukrainian city of Bakhmut unless Moscow supplies more arms. Many called it an empty threat, and so it has proved. Prigozhin now says he's gotten those guarantees. His statements that he cares about his troops, uh, that's, that's basically not true. This Canadian analyst of Kremlin politics says it can be difficult to know Prigozhin's true motivations and just how great the rift is with the Kremlin. The more intelligence resources are dedicated to Prigozhin and his theatrics and drama with the Russian Ministry of Defense, Shoigu, uh, the less we're talking about other no factors of what is going on. Further west on the front lines, there's a sense of panic in areas near Europe's largest nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine. Russia is now evacuating towns in the region ahead of an anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive. The UN's Atomic Energy Agency boss says he is extremely concerned about the situation, adding that all sides must act now to prevent the threat of a severe nuclear accident. Experts say multiple backup systems make it unlikely that damage to the site would cause a meltdown, but if it does happen, it could affect a 20 to 40 kilometer radius. Redmond Channel, Global News, London. Explosions could be heard on the streets of Khartoum, Sudan today, even as envoys from the country's warring factions met for peace talks. Since mid-April, the battle for control of the country has left hundreds dead and it's forced more than 100,000 people to flee. Peace talks are being held in Saudi Arabia and backed by the U.S. And while they're seen as the first serious attempt to end the fighting, both sides have made it very clear they will only discuss a humanitarian truce, not negotiate an end to the war. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is now back from King Charles's coronation, while he did some diplomatic business while in London. As David Aiken reports, not even the Atlantic Ocean could separate Trudeau from one of the most pressing issues in Ottawa, the alleged plot by China to intimidate a Conservative MP. Saturday's coronation was the main bit of business for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's two nights in London, but it was also a chance for Trudeau and UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak to talk about global affairs. Uh, always a pleasure to sit down with you, Rishi. A key file, Russia's war against Ukraine. That will be a top topic when Trudeau, Sunak and other G7 leaders meet in Japan 10 days from now. So lots of uh, opportunities for us to uh, uh, make sure that as we always are, we're, uh, we're uh, aligning in our values and our approach to make sure that the, uh, uh, the impacts on, on countries around the world are, are as positive as possible. Next month, the UK will host the Ukraine Reconstruction Conference and Canada expects to be a significant participant in that initiative. On Sunday morning, though, 
Trudeau was asked about domestic matters. Why had his government not yet expelled a Chinese diplomat that Canada's Security Intelligence Service identified as playing a part in a plot two years ago to intimidate Conservative MP Michael Chong and his family? That two-year-old plot came to light just last week. Trudeau said the delay was warranted because Beijing might retaliate if Canada expelled one of its diplomats. One thinks of uh, pork, one thinks of canola, one thinks of uh, various, uh, various real consequences uh, that Canada and other countries around the world have faced in various situations. If China's just going to carry on with what it does anyway. Speaking on the West Block, Chong said it was absurd to telegraph to China that Beijing has leverage over Canada. Unfortunately, we got to this place because the government previously hasn't taken action to expel, to expel diplomats from authoritarian states like the PRC or Russia who have engaged in coercive and intimidation activities here on Canadian soil. This is a decision not to be taken lightly, and the foreign minister is leaning into this very, very carefully. And when will that decision be taken? The government has not yet said. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. The coronation and the lingering effects of colonialism. Coming up, the country is cutting ties with the Crown and King Charles. Eight people were killed Saturday in the latest mass shooting in the United States. The heavily armed gunmen opened fire seemingly at random at a busy outlet mall in Allen, Texas, just outside of Dallas. The gunman was killed by police and seven other people are in hospital. There have been at least 198 mass shootings in the U.S. so far this year. And a new national poll done for Fox News found that 80% of Americans are in favor of stronger gun laws. And there is another tragedy that's unfolding in Texas, and this time it's in the border town of Brownsville. At least seven people are dead, and at least a dozen more suffer injuries after they were hit by an SUV that plowed into a busy bus stop this morning. The bus stop located outside a shelter that had been housing migrants. The driver has been arrested and charged with reckless driving, and police say more charges are likely. To the United Kingdom now, we're following the extravagant coronation of King Charles. Today's celebrations were more down to earth. No fancy invite needed for the big lunch. That's the British tradition that is intended to bring neighbors together to celebrate the crowning, even as support for the monarchy wanes. Taria Isri has more on the debate raging in the UK and abroad about the king's place in the modern day. Hi, T a centuries-old tradition that continues to this day. Dainty china, scones and biscuits. A chocolate tart with hummingbird chocolate. It doesn't get more British than this. But even in this tea room, some of the attitudes about the royals are lukewarm. The whole issue of the monarchy is kind of, I'm indifferent or it could go away and it wouldn't bother me. Welcome to have a look and choose the tea. These friends are more definitive. They want out with the colonial aspect and the imperial aspect that it's just really outdated. Now that it's Charles, all of my interests have just <laughs> gone down the drain. There's indifference about the monarchy, even disdain. And then there are countries who want to break ties entirely. And that list of nations is growing. 15 countries recognize King Charles as head of state. But six Caribbean nations are considering leaving the monarchy and following in the footsteps of Barbados, which became a republic two years ago. It is a symbol of white privilege. Um, for some people, it is a symbol of white supremacy. Jamaica wants to do away with that symbol. It plans to leave the monarchy by 2025 and is fighting for slavery reparations from Britain. As I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. For this professor of Caribbean history, the king's recent remarks fall short. Prince Charles um, was present at the ceremony, acknowledged the place of histories of slavery in the country's decision, but couldn't bring himself to apologize. In Canada, there are those who believe the royals are still relevant. In an era where there is more and more dissatisfaction with politicians who are seen as a source of um, um, division, um, there is great uh, advantage in having this uh, ceremonial figurehead that is 
quite the opposite and is a symbol of unity. For others, it's simpler to keep the status quo. It's easier to just leave things as they are than to change things up. A debate about whether to toast or toss a royal relationship. Taria Isri, Global News, Ottawa. Ahead, Margaret Atwood on censorship and the challenges to gender equality in publishing. From Margaret Atwood to Toni Morrison, some of the most famous writers on the planet are women. Yet in the world of publishing, women, on average, still earn less, sell fewer books, and win fewer awards than men. A new literary prize aims to change all of that. Our Jackson Prosco traveled to Nashville to speak to one of the famous voices backing it. This award goes to Fatima Oscar. It took 11 years of planning to make this happen. This week, Fatima Ashgar was awarded the first ever Carol Shields Prize for Fiction, the richest literary award for women and non-binary writers. I feel like I'm not even like on this planet right now. <laughs> yeah, I feel really, really excited and really honored um, and just, it's very surreal. The $150,000 U.S. prize is unique and is backed by one of the most famous women to ever put pen to paper. This is a huge prize and uh, as, as a veteran, I can tell you that prizes can kickstart people's careers if people pay enough attention to them. On average, women writers still make less money, win fewer awards, and see less promotion of their books than men. Atwood's international success is the exception. Women read books by men and women, and men read books by men, unless, unless the woman is quite old like me. <laughs> or write sci-fi. You know. If you were to give advice to young women who are just starting out, just beginning their writing journey, what would you tell them? High aspirations, low expectations. <laughs> so if you have low expectations, you don't get too dis disappointed. If you have high aspirations, you, you try your best. This award, named for Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Carol Shields, aims to help spread success. The four runners-up are also given prizes. Other emerging writers will be mentored. So we see this as fulfilling Carol Shields' idea of writing away the invisibility of women's lives and supporting a woman writer at every stage of her career. It comes at a fraught time for literature, especially in the United States. Books are being banned from libraries and schools for mentioning gender, sexuality and race. Atwood's Handmaid's Tale is among the most frequently pulled from shelves in America. She urges young writers not to back down. Should they worry about writing something that's going to get them banned? Uh, no, <laughs> they should not. Um, it's especially not by those people. But there's, it's, 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 it's across the spectrum, you know, trying to shut writers down. And, and we've seen it in all different kinds of regimes, and we've seen it throughout history. So nothing new. So much. What is new is the support for the next generation of authors with an award that can help them defy the odds and write their next chapter. I really hope that it'll mean that like folks can write their own stories and write stories that they really care about and, and to know that there's an authorship and there's a readership for them. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Nashville. Next, Gordon Lightfoot, icon and hometown hero. Aurelia Ontario's fond farewell to the folk music legend. A Canadian music legend's hometown gathered to say their farewell today. Gordon Lightfoot, who died Monday at the age of 84, returned one last time to Aurelia, Ontario, where fans gathered to pay their respects to one of this country's greatest songwriters. Global Toronto's Alan Carter joins us from Aurelia with more Quite the Crowd behind you, Alan. Farah, mourners and well-wishers have come out in the rain here in Aurelia for an opportunity to pay their respects to Canadian musical icon Gordon Lightfoot. Lightfoot, of course, from Aurelia, and he attended this church as a child and even sang here. Gordon 
Lightfoot's music plays across the street from a church in Aurelia. I've known Gord all my life. I've lived in Aurelia all my life. And I, he lived a great life. Mourners lined up to say farewell to the musician who was born in this city, 150 kilometers north of Toronto in 1938. Lightfoot was respected internationally, but revered locally. The fact that he loved the city, and it really meant a lot to him, and um, he's never, he never forgot his roots. Telling stories of Canada in song, of railroads and shipwrecks, Lightfoot was both musician and history teacher. I had to uh, come and send my prayers to Gord for all the things that he's done and opened up a lot of stories of indigenous uh, culture, you know, to many people. If Aurelia was his hometown, Massey Hall in Toronto was his home away from home. He performed there more than 70 times. He continued to perform until he was no longer able to, telling his longtime bass player and friend, I think the last, he repeated this a few times, but I think he said my, my life's work is done was probably, I would think, the la one of the last things he spoke. It's that life's work, Lightfoot's music, that brought fans to this visitation. All the times listening to him, <clears throat> good times and bad, uh, yeah. he's just always been there. He never forgot Aurelia, and you know, we knew it. So like I say, welcome back home, Gord, it's where you belong. Today, the bells at this church chime 29 times, just like the line from Gordon Lightfoot's famous song commemorating the lives lost in the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And then the bell chimed one final time for Lightfoot himself. Farah? Alan Carter in Aurelia, Ontario. Thank you, Alan. And that's Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Farah Nasser. In the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald you with that song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, one of Gordon Lightfoot's biggest hits and a Canadian cultural monument. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? The searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay if they'd put 15 more miles behind her.